This is our flow chart, um, which is essentially what we do for all of our clinical patients, even outside of research. Um, but basically, we have a screening visit, um, we get an HIV test, and within two weeks of that visit, we need to initiate PrEP. Um, we do all of the STI screening, as we talked about, uh, and then the only thing that's extra in this study is that we got uh, urine testing um, every two to four weeks, actually, um, and every and then twice during the year, we got uh, plasma tenofovir levels. This is the t our sort of table one of demographic information. Uh, our, our median age was 22, largely African-American uh, group. There were um, some transgender individuals, um, and you can sort of see from the risk factors or the, the demographic data below that um, most of them had a, had a little schooling but not a lot. 66% uh, of them had an annual income less than 10%, and then if you go down to the bottom risk factors for HIV, um, most of them had more than one risk factor, in inconsistent condom use, recent STI, exchange of sex or commodities, et cetera. Um, and so this, these are our retention data. So we have data right now out to 36 weeks. So the trial will, complete, will be completed formally in July. Um, but uh, essentially 70% of our subjects are retained in care at 36 weeks. And retained in care we're defining as um, picking up their meds more than 50% of the time um, and have a study visit still at 36 weeks. So, so already um, we were very pleasantly surprised to see these kinds of retention numbers because this is what we, th we thought was reflected in our um, anecdotal experience of our program in which our retention is quite high. These are our adherence data. Um, and these were um, very exciting for us. So, so at weeks four, 12, and 24, um, we still we maintained very high adherence um, by both urine and plasma assay. So this is using both, um, essentially, uh, because again, there was almost 100% concordance between the urine test and the plasma results. And so at week 24, 83% of our subjects had um, uh, urine and plasma levels actually consistent with adherence. 12% of our subjects had that low positive sort of category where um, they're taking a little bit, but they haven't taken it consistently, uh, which the urine test allows you to know. The plasma test only tells you about the last day or two. Um, and then 5% of our patients essentially have, were not taking it at all. Um, and so I just sort of overlaid, um, again, that that graph you had seen earlier with the self-report is the barred line up there, the broken line, and then this was the Chicago data, and then the plasma levels um, going down to 20% at 24 weeks, and that orange bar, bar up top um, is, the, is the adherence data that we have in our program. This is how we use it in practice. So this is our flow sheet. Uh, we have a prep, a prep, in our EMR, we were able to build. We use Prime Suite, which is a, maybe, I don't know, everyone probably uses different uh, EMRs in, in, the, um, in the community. I'm not sure what you guys use here. Do you, do you use Epic? What's your one? Centricity. Centricity. So, uh, so in our system, uh, we can sort of build flow sheets in a modular way, and this is our prep flow sheet. So um, we have HIV viral load, um, which now actually we do fourth gen testing um, as well, but, or instead we have all of our STI screening. This is a snapshot. You can see this person had a nice new syphilis test with a titer of one to 32. Um, and across that top row, you can see their tenofovir um, levels in their urine. And so this is a, an example of a, of a person with consistent high level adherence uh, to PrEP, which is great, again, in the setting of a, um, a recent uh, newly acquired syphilis test. This patient um, uh, is an example of a patient with inconsistent adherence. And this is something with this level of detail that would be hard to get from um, either self-report or, for example, dried blood spot, which is another uh, um, adherence monitoring tool in the research setting that gives you information, sort of like a hemoglobin A1C over the last three months, what's the average number of pills they've taken per week. Um, but you can see here, this person, uh, I sort of cut it off, but all the way on the left, they had some, a value between zero and 1,000, and then around December of last year, they jumped up to greater than 1,000, and then boom, completely stopped it over the holidays. Um, and then come New Year, New Year's resolution, January 12th, they have a beautiful high level of, of urine, tenofovir, and then as all New Year's resolutions usually end up um, going by the wayside, so too did his. 
um, and he came off the the Truvada. And so, you know, he this was a young man uh, who had, you know, told us he was consistently taking prep. And so this we, we were able to say like hey, what was going on last year that you were doing okay and then sort of fell apart and now you're completely off of it. What, you know, what's, what's going on? Um, these are our STI rates. Um, so far, again, we're not all the way to week 48, but we do um, have very high rates of STI. So again, we only have 50 people in this, uh, in this cohort and you can see that 22 of them in the first 24 weeks had either chlamydia or gonorrhea uh, 29 of them had uh, chlamydia or gonorrhea in the second 48 weeks, uh, second 24 weeks thus far. We also had two diagnoses of syphilis uh, in the first half of the study period and one diagnosis of uh, genital herpes, new diagnosis of genital herpes. Uh, and I think just to, to point out the obvious here that if we weren't screening blue or red rectal or pharyngeal um, for for gonorrhea chlamydia, you, you would see we would only get be getting a fraction of the um, positive STIs um, uh, compared to what we're seeing. Um, and then this was really, I think, heartening to us, perspectives on PrEP. So uh, again, just specifically looking at this very young high-risk population um, across the board, did being on PrEP and then having an objective way to monitor and feed their adherence back to them affect their opinion about their own um, self-efficacy and their own risk uh, and um, their behaviors. So uh, green is significant increase. Um, so green and blue are increase and orange is no change. Purple and red are decrease. And so you can see condom use essentially didn't change, um, which is sort of what you would expect. Discussing HIV with a partner significantly increased. So I think that was a, a lovely thing. Number of partners very clearly did not change over the course of the one-year study. Um, and, um, but perceived risk of acquiring HIV went down, which is what you would want. You would want people to feel less scared um, and a little bit more certain that they're taking appropriate steps to prevent HIV. Um, perceived protection likewise went up uh, and knowledge or attitudes about preventing, uh, their ability to prevent their cell, themselves from getting HIV increased uh, significantly. So this is, I think, in line with a lot of the data we know about risk disinhibition, right? That people aren't being riskier because they're on PrEP. They're not having more partners or using less condoms, um, but they're really starting to be able to feel like they know how to protect themselves and they're safer and they're able to open up with potential or current partners and say, let's talk about HIV, uh, let's talk about PrEP. Um, and so uh, just to conclude that um, study, we'll have the final results after July, but essentially we feel um, that urine testing uh, of tenofovir in our practice allowed us to monitor PrEP adherence amongst a very high-risk group in a community-based organization. Our adherence was greater than 83% at 24 weeks um, by urine and plasma, actually, and retention in care was about 70% at 36 weeks. So that's also telling you people are taking their meds that aren't necessarily coming in as frequently. So, so adherence is higher than retention, which we know from the HIV literature that adherence and retention don't actually go together. There are a lot of people that take their meds and never show up to a visit, and then there are a lot of people that show up every week, um, and you all know them, and they're not taking their meds. Um, and so, the, you know, it's no surprise, it's the same, uh, it's the same for PrEP. Uh, and high rates of STIs throughout the study period. Um, and then lastly, I just want to talk a little bit about how our youth themselves have, have started to speak out about their experiences on PrEP in sort of urban Philadelphia. Um, we have Malcolm over here uh, who um, we, we were really excited to be able to get onto Fox 29. Um, and he not only talked about PrEP on Fox 29, but he actually came out to his family and his community about being gay on Fox 29, which was incredibly brave uh, and was a wonderful experience um, from, to hear, you know, from his perspective. Um, actually, uh, it was his decision to do so, of course. Um, we had Stephen, Malcolm, and Miles, who were in ANU Magazine, um, and, you know, Mal Miles says, it gives me a better outlook on life and lowers my risk. It lets me know I can still live my life taking PrEP. Um, and then over on the right, that's not actually Oberon, that's Marcus. Uh, I have a mismatch quote there because I had to figure out a way to get Oberon's quote in with it, but I didn't have his picture. Um, but Marcus on the top there, he's sort of agreed to be our, um, our poster child for PrEP. He was our, our first patient on PrEP in our program in January 2013. 
Um, and he's on all of our promotional materials. He's also um, testified for the Pennsylvania Board of Health when we really argued to get uh, PrEP covered by um, our ADAP program, so SBPB um, in Pennsylvania. And he testified. He did an incredible job. Um, it keeps everybody honest. Uh, when, when someone actually is there who's really affected uh, um, by the need to, to have uh, PrEP covered uh, for people who are uninsured. Um, and then Oberon, I love quoting him, a uh, young man who was born into poverty and uh, his mother's uh, favorite uh, writer was Shakespeare and so named him after Shakespeare, her favorite Shakespearean character. Uh, and and uh, t true to his name uh, is an incredibly eloquent young man uh, who says PrEP is more than just a pill, it's a whole system. Um, and then uh, I keep saying finally, but this really is finally. Uh, <laughs> one of the things that we really try and do, and you'll hear more of this from Caitlin uh, in the panel, our director of PrEP programs, um, is that we're, uh, we're really trying to change the dialogue around PrEP. Um, and uh, you, know, you can see here a lot of the images that we've put out in the community about HIV testing. Um, and, you know, they're really sort of a little bit scary, and they're red and black, um, and there's lines and bars, uh, and there's no round things, there's harsh edges. Um, you know, here's a crossfire, have you been hit? He's the one, you know, I thought he was HIV negative, only sluts get HIV. So, you know, we can learn a lot about what we did really right and what we didn't do so right uh, with respect to HIV testing and HIV treatment when we think about this wonderful new opportunity that we have to prevent HIV um, and really change the dialogue from PrEP as pre-exposure prophylaxis to PrEP as proactive, responsible, empowered pleasure and thinking about positive images. Um, positive images around PrEP. So PrEP for pride, PrEP for love, PrEP for your future, sex PrEP love. And then the, that sort of middle black and white campaign is a fabulous campaign that came out of Chicago. Jim Pickett's uh, uh, amazing uh, efforts and his team um, to really combine, as you can see, a word that uh, would sound sort of scary, catch, transmit, contract, contract, spread, with a word that was very sexy, sort of a desire, love, heat, tingle, um, to kind of meld those two together to force us to understand that, you know, sex is messy uh, and prevention is important. And, and these are things that, you know, that are, that are just a part of who we are and, and something that we should offer to everybody. Uh, and, you know, one of the things just in terms of prep for your future that I think uh, one of the um, res research studies that um, to me I've heard in the last couple of years that was most jarring is a study that somebody did with um, uh, looking at text messages uh, and sort of analyzing the, 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 the content of text messages in the, you know, sort of geospatially in, in, the, in Philadelphia and looking and basically they found that future, future indicating words like I will, you know, I will think, um, sort of anything that indicates like a future, those areas of the city were at lower risk of, uh, had lower rates of, H as of HIV. Um, and essentially when you had lower rates of these sort of future, um, you know, indicating um, phrases, those were the areas in which the, uh, the HIV rates were the highest. And essentially, you know, again, thinking about offering folks options for a future, to build a future that's gonna be safe, um, and one in which they uh, they are invested. And so finally, um, <laughs> this is my new slide for the talk. Uh, um, please feel free to contact either Caitlin or I uh, with any questions that you have. We're happy to um, to tell you about the things that we um, have struggled with. You know, certainly we've had our challenges, um, we've had our our failures, um, and we've had our successes. Um, and uh, we would absolutely love to come and chat with you, have you visit our program, we'll visit your program, we've done a lot of trainings, um, and we're happy to do that for, uh, for anybody that's interested. Also, if anybody um, wants to talk about urine testing, programs are now sending us our, their, their urine samples uh, um, so that they can offer adherence support to their patients as well, and so if that's something that anybody's interested in, um, we can certainly talk about that as well. And that's all. Thank you so much.